We're just trying to change the world here, people. Oh, really? Welcome back to A Really Radio. This is show 152. Yes. Yep. This is the B-side. So this is the, uh, we're going to talk about Trump's 100th day in office, which, depending on where you start the calendar from, is really about today. And today is now Sunday, April 30th, 2017, where we dismantle the current events for your entertainment through mostly rational conversations that make you go, oh, really? I'm your Standy Cowan, and I have with me my provocateur and co-host, Fred Sims. Yeah, I'm still here. Yeah, he's still here. So, uh, again, we still make mistakes. So if you find one, let us know about it. Send us a note to O'Reilly Radio Podcast at gmail.com or phone it in or text us at 470-222-6759. That's O-R-L-Y. And also a big thank you to our Patreon supporters. We've got Donald Davis, we've got Melissa G, we've got Henry, and we've got Daniel Duncan out there. If you would like to be a member in their ranks, you can help us at www.patreon.com slash O'Reilly Radio and uh, supporters at any level will get access to off-topic conversations, stuff that's in between, stuff that's before, stuff that's after, and uh, depending on the week, stuff before everyone else. So you can join us there. All right, so um, amazingly enough, the world has not ended. It has been 100 days of the Trump presidency, the number 45, President 45, and we're still alive at least. So we've got that going for us, which is nice. But um well, let's see. What's your uh, what's your 100-day perspective, Fred? What do you think about the Trump administration as we pass what everyone said was give him 100 days. Give him 100 days. Let's see what happens. Okay, I've given him 100 days. We all have, yes. I've seen what's happened. Uh-huh. And what I've seen is not a lot. Not a lot at all. Okay. Um, I've seen him repeatedly state that the job is much harder than he thought it was. <laughs> he has said that a few times, hasn't he? Yeah, at least three or four different times about three or four different topics. Yeah, um, that he of, said were easy before, yeah, I believe. One of I them was just a general, this is a lot harder than I thought. I believe he was quoted as saying, I liked my previous life. I was able to focus on you know this particular thing. This is a lot harder than my previous life. Yeah. Um, I resist the urge to say no shit, despite <laughs> saying no shit. Um, yeah, yeah. He has essentially done nothing that he promised his voting base that he was going to do. He's made attempts. He may have yeah. things in the works. I, I, I kind of disagree in that, in that he has tried, he has at least tried to f fulfill almost all of the campaign promises that he's made. Right, but, but when I'm looking at what have you accomplished, because when you come out and say, within 30 days I'm going to do this, within 100 days I'm going to do this, yeah. that doesn't mean... I tried. That means I'm going to do. You're selling them on, I'm going to get in there and get this work done. Work that you want done, that you're saying you want done, I'm going to do it. It's going to be done in this time frame. And none of it has been successful. So for me, those are all fails. Fail, yeah. fail, fail, fail. Until he actually gets one of the things through and it happens, which again, you are a Republican president. Air. You have a Republican Senate. You have a Republican, you have a Republican Senate, House. Republican House. You have... Now you have a, re, a, a, by all means, a Republican Supreme Court. Yeah, uh, basically. Um, yeah, because you got, no, you got Gorsuch in there. You got that. importantly, what you have is a... You no longer have the need for a supermajority in certain things to get them done in Congress. If you play the system the right yeah. way, you don't have to have 60 votes in the Senate in order to get things done. Right, because so, they will play the nuclear option to make it happen. They've proven that, you know, with the Gorsuch. Uh, and even not yeah. going that route, as long as the way they do things, it ends up being fiscally neutral. Thank you, opening arguments, for directing me in this. Yeah. It ends up being fiscally neutral. 
you don't have to have 60 votes. You just need 50. And even in a tie 50-50, it's just going to go to Pence as the leader of the Senate. Right. He's going to cast the vote 51 and you win. So you don't even need the 60 votes anymore. You have all of the, it. It is literally tipped over dominoes in yeah. your favor. And, and yet he still can't make things get done. Nothing. That is remarkable. The only things that you have done are but is Gorsuch. that about the but is that about the president or is that about the Republican Party? You know wh which one he is technically the head. Technically. Whether, whether they want to claim him or whether he wants to claim them, like yeah. there are certain things, and I know that that we live in and and as Amber is fond of saying, it's 2017 and nothing matters. Yeah. But it regardless of that, there are still. I mean, they still exist. They're hard to find. But yeah. There are these things called facts. Yeah, and so, and, yeah and we so like those around here. Facts still state a couple of things. And one of them is, it doesn't matter if you want to claim them or if they want to claim you. You ran on the Republican ticket. You are a Republican. When, when people look in the history books, it will say, Trump, Republican, President. That's what it's going to say. So you are their head. You represent them. They represent you. It's all part and parcel. So if they can't get together and make things happen, I mean, I'm fine with that. I really am. I would rather his first 365 days be useless garbage. It, it, nothing happens. Sure, he spends a ton of money and, you know, a ton of tax money yeah. with his little golf ventures. But if he accomplishes the, nothing more than Gorsuch is on the Supreme Court and he, uh, air, you know, bombed a Syrian airbase in response to, you know, a, a chemical attack. I'm perfectly fine with that first year. Let's keep that going. Four years of that. Because it's that much less that he is able to do that damages everything else that's been built up to make our country what it actually is, as, as good as it was, um, despite being labeled as not great. Now, it's also erroneous for me to say that because there are other things he's done. He's obviously had a... He's had a, a good number of executive orders. He's rolled back a good number He's of things. He's had many that, numbers of them, yes. Yeah, a good number of things that the Obama administration put in place to further things like the arts and sciences. He's defunded arts and sciences. He's defunded, you know, a lot of programs that are beneficial to the country. You know, they there are some things that he's done um, that, to me, when I look at those... I, I look at them as unfortunate stop gaps until we have the next president in four years. Because once we have another president, those things are all going to get fixed. It's not as big as, let's say, a yeah. border wall between us and Mexico that then we're going to have to either live with for however long or we're going to then have to fund to take down. No, we so, won't take it down. We'll just let it rot. So, I mean, it doesn't matter. Once it's there, I mean, yeah, it, the, the worst problem with a border wall is that we would have to maintain it and that we'd have to patrol it. Yeah, and the, the maintaining of it, I believe estimates put it at like $750 million a year. That's if you do it. Yep. Otherwise, it's still going to be there. It's whether or not it's effectual. But I heard an argument recently that what they would, what Republicans would end up using that as is you build it, it, you, you don't spend the money to maintain it, it falls into disrepair, and then Republicans use that as a platform of, oh, look what Democrats have allowed to happen. Oh, you know? one of those. Yes. Uh, so, I mean, it, yeah. Like, again, it is very unfortunate, the things that money is being pulled from right now. But I do not see that as in 2020 or 2018. You know, like I, yeah. I don't see that as being a forever thing. Money will go back into those services. It's just going to be right now. Citizens are going to have to do everything they can to fund those areas to keep them afloat. And yeah. that's unfortunate. It shouldn't happen because that's why we have government in the first place. That's why we have these organizations so that those things can be provided for us, not we're providing them for ourselves. But if we can keep them afloat, it's going to come back. So I, I do view them as things he's accomplished, but it's not what he ran on. Those are just things that after the fact, people are like, hey, I want you to target this. I want you to target this. Or he was like, I'm going to target this. Yeah. And and did them as, as kind of toss-ins or throwaways because no, one's, no one can really fight him on them. And he doesn't require 
a group of people that can't get their shit together to vote on it and get it done in order for it to happen. So, you know, those are just their tertiary pieces. Yes, accomplishments if you want to put them out there. But I, I mean, if I were him, I wouldn't. Like, I, well, I he has add been them to my list of things I've accomplished. Yeah, he has been backpedaling from the whole 100 day benchmark. That he, you know, it's like, ah, 100 days, that's kind of arbitrary. It doesn't really mean anything. And yeah, we, we tend to agree with that. But at the same time, all the other talking heads and everybody where they were really counting on it, it's like, hey, give him 100 days because 100 days well, is a nice it's, round it's, number. It's not it doesn't mean that. much. It, like, uh, you know, you have these. It is longer than the, than the waiting period that most people have at their, at their new job. Well, yeah, because you know when you could just say day. you don't you don't get any yep. yeah you don't get any um, any benefits after until ninety days or but whatever. The hundred days is arbitrary, but it's so traditionally arbitrary that yeah. you hear about it in all of the elections. You know the talking heads are always talking. You know that like, should be a new term. Traditionally arbitrary. Yeah, it's, it's traditionally arbitrary <laughs> yeah. enough that what, what you end up thing. having is when they do the debates, you'll or or even when they're just doing interviews, what are you going to accomplish in your first hundred days? What are you you know when you get in there? What are the first things you're going to accomplish? Yeah. And you sell yourself on those things because whether people want to you know like yes the you know the the points and the platforms are all important and these issues are important but what people want to know is what are you going to do for me yeah it's you know you're only as good as what you've done for me lately so what are you going to do when you get in there because i expect you on day one in the presidency to immediately have it down hit the ground running yeah. and start doing all the shit for me because i voted for you my vote comes at a cost and that cost is you accomplishing what you tell me you're going to accomplish so to backpedal, I mean, it means something to me and you, but I mean, in the law, it's not going to mean anything to the people that voted for him. Oh, well, they're going to open up another Twitter. The the people that are disenfranchised that they voted for Trump and he didn't accomplish the hundred days. Right. You know, it it's not going to matter. Like he's not going to care. It's only going to matter to us. But I enjoy seeing someone who made all these promises and realistically is below the fabled Mendoza line of 200 as a batting average um, in actually getting anywhere with them. Like, that that makes me happy. You know, and, and it's a situation where in that first 100 days, I took a break from the show because listening to all of the things Trump was such a huge pile of negative garbage that I just had to kind of decompress. Um, so the fact that we are where we are now, we are still alive, we're, you know, basically not living under a uh, nuclear winter, and he is largely ineffectual currently. I I kind of smile at that. I mean, I know there's a ton of stuff not to, but I'm I'm choosing to be optimistic in, in the thing I'm looking at right now. The um, I'm seeing some really weird uh, conflicting things on where his approval rating is and he's not helping that either. no no because he he keeps asking for different things uh and also calling out different things what whatever agrees with him is real whatever doesn't agree with him is fake news so it's it's hard to figure out but right now the according to gallup which is basically the only poll that i can really go with at this point um Trump approval rating is 43%. And that's going to be with a bump due to the the recent Syria um, intervention, I'm guessing. Because a lot of people yeah. seem to... The Syria is a weird... Yeah, Syria is a weird thing that has happened. Because it was almost as long as he did something, he was going to be okay. Doing nothing was unconscionable. Doing something, even if it was ineffectual, was still going to bump him in the numbers. Yeah. Because of, again, there was the mo emotional appeal. Did it really do anything? No. Not really. Because that, that airfield and potentially the sarin gas or whatever it was that they happened to have on, on hand was possible and replenished within 72 hours. Yep. Not a big deal. Um, the 
the administration's turn on Russia being cool to Russia being not so cool has been telling, but again, not very effectual. He's tried to to reach everything that he said on the on his way to be president. He's hit all of the major buttons that he said that he was going to. He has been ineffectual in all of them. Whether it be health care, you know, re- repealing and replacing Obamacare exploded in his face. Less so his face than Paul Ryan's face. Right. Because Ryan care has been a horrible thing that never happened. Thankfully, for most of the people that are on the Affordable Care Act, which, by the way, is the same thing as Obamacare, for those of you that didn't understand that. You ought to know that by now, at least. Um, At least those people aren't losing their coverage and aren't dying. They're still trying, mind you. This isn't gone. They still have a hard-on for making sure that people die thanks to not having health care. As recently as yesterday. Yeah. Uh, different polls say different things. Some some of the more conservative polls, of course, they're focused on very conservative ideals and very conservative respondents. And they're saying that you know Trump's approval rating is pretty high. Uh, some of the more liberal ones are saying that his approval rating is way in the dumpster. So we can, you know, we know that there's biases in play. Of course, there's always implicit biases. Um, That's why I think you're you're sticking with Gallup is is yeah. pretty. You know, they're going to be as close to what you want to see. They're they're very reliable. And if it's not, uh, you know, a very liberal, you know, strictly liberal source, you don't have to worry about those biases. Right. And it's not a strictly conservative. So I mean, when you're seeing the range of you know high twenties, low thirties mm-hmm. to mid to high fifties. Right. You know that. Shooting right in the middle there, 43, you know, uh, again, uh, the 43 is, is going to be the benefit of, you know, the, the recent stuff with Syria. And you're going to see that go down because old swing and a miss is going to do something else that is he's going to put out there, swing and a miss. His voting base is going to become a little more disenfranchised. Um, yeah. You know, it, the, I mean, 43 is still only covering people that would have voted Republican. You know, I don't think he's got a whole lot of, you know, liberal support in that 43. Well, what's interesting here is, you know, because Gallup's pretty good. They've got, they got this down. This is what they do. And there's an article out on the 28th, so two days ago at, at the time of this recording. Uh, near 100-day mark, Trump approval exposes fragmented United States. Uh, and then they've got an interesting uh, look here. Let me see if I can pull up the so everybody can see. Is it going to show me there? That's the wrong one. This one. There we go. Okay, so working class country is 64, 64% approval of Trump. The aging farmlands which is an interesting demographic on its own, 64% as well. Evangelical hubs. Okay. 63%. Rural middle America, which I'm not sure how that's different from aging farmlands, is 54%. The LDS enclaves, Latter-day Saints, which I didn't know they have their own segment. Enclaves area, yeah. Yeah. That are enough to represent, like, a... Yeah, so the Mormon community, 53%. They were really against him to begin with because of how not biblical marriage he was, you know, divorced and all the all the things that he said, you know, very, uh, very unpalatable to them. The graying America. Again, they, these are just funny little segments that they have here. How many? Fifty-two um, percent. You're at. You've said five or six different segments. That's the sixth segments one. Yeah. Are, lift, are listed. Fifteen. Okay, so you're a little less than halfway through. Yeah. And right now, all of these groups seem really targeted one way. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay, so. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Military posts are fifty-two percent. The 
exurbs. So I guess the suburbs and things that are like it. So right now is military the lowest at fifty two out of what you've said? Right now, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Going this is going down. Okay. In descending order from approval. And then they're they're in fifty percent, the exurbs, which I'm not sure what that demographic is. I'll have to dig into that. Then there's the middle suburbs, forty eight percent. Native American lands, forty seven percent. African American South, forty four percent. Hispanic centers, thirty nine percent. College towns, you know. Now we're getting into the educated areas, the the centers of education, as it were, forty percent. The urban suburbs, thirty four percent. Big cities, twenty eight percent. Big cities, of course, being where the most populous centers are, which is a big section. That's their, a big segment. Their breakdown of like. How that you know, like uh, urban suburbs, suburbs, that kind of thing, and an, and an ex- exurb, just so you know, is defined as a district outside a city, especially a prosperous area beyond the suburbs. So past the suburbs, yes, but, but still, still within commuting distance kind and of thing. prosperous. So I'm thinking, interesting, you know, probably those enclaves of people with money from the city but they don't want to let you know they kind of want to just pool up in their areas yeah you know that that's yeah. what i'm thinking um Interesting. I, I don't really have a place to compare it to around here because we're all just but if i was i was going to think somewhere like um viera in those little areas that like you kind of go out of the way and it's just like those gated deed restricted communities where it's all the the more wealthy people that's what i'm thinking um but it, it's uh, yeah. so like because when you say a district outside a city, oh, you mean a suburb? No, no, no. Like, like just past that. <laughs> like that's a, that's what we mean. Yeah. Well, why don't you just call it a suburb and count it all the same? It's interesting. The um, President Obama's uh, approval rating in the first hundred days by community type is almost a mirror of that. Shocking, right? With the I mean, same groups. Yeah. Big cities, urban suburbs, rural Hispanic centers. So this is this is what they track by. Um, in the first 100 days, big cities were 71 percent approval for Obama. For Obama, okay. I, well, when yeah. you said a mirror, I was um, I was thinking a mirror number wise, and I'm like, holy shit, he was only at like 28 percent in big cities, but that makes sense. No, no, uh, opposite. Yeah, the opposite of that. Um, uh, yeah, urban suburbs, rural Hispanic centers. You know all. All the one. Interestingly enough, he was in fifty percent approval rating, all the way up to aging farmlands. They're the they gave him a forty five percent approval rating, but still forty five percent. Yeah. So really, and that was Trump's not doing so good. <laughs> that was his hundred days of the first presidency, or hundred days of the second. First one hundred days. Okay, so that's okay. Period. First one hundred days. Um, yeah, because that was done in 2009. So, yeah, so first so 2008 days being total. his first. Yeah. Yep. Uh it's it's interesting. I was wondering what the demographics were here and these numbers come from an anal- analysis of Gallup tracking data on Trump's job approval rate performant. Yeah. Job approval performed with the American Community Projects uh, ACP at George Washington University. The ACP breaks the nation's 3,100 counties into 15 types using demographic, economic, and cultural data. The result is a, demo- a geographic map of the nation's affinity communities available here. And there's AmericanCommunities.org is where that uh, that lives. So you too can can check it out ACP American Communities Project. Um it's it's interesting. So these demographics do not exactly take into account population count. This is just population type. Yep. So yeah, again, when you're the big cities, big cities where you're only 28% and that's where most of the people are, right. which again where most of the people that voted against you are, hence the reason why you lost yeah. the popular vote because of those big cities. You know, you just happened to get all of the gerrymandered small counties of exurbanites and be them what they are, yeah. You know, aging farmlanders, all six yeah. of those guys. 
Yeah, meth- this is it's an interesting thing to look at. It's like, okay, so why are you calling it this? What does that mean? Uh, I will leave that mostly up to the uh, up to the listeners to to take a look at because um, you know we could do an entire show just on this one website. Well, yeah, and um, um, I'm imagining that there is probably decent information on each one of how those groups are broken down um, in the quick search I did for like what Xurb is. Mm-hmm. Um, just the the Wikipedia kind of um, uh, for commuter town. So it says the expression exurb was coined by August uh, Comte Specter Sky in his 1955 book The Exurbanites to describe the ring of prosperous communities beyond the suburbs that are commuter towns for an urban area. So uh, essentially the wealthy people that are commuting, yeah. but they're just outside the suburbs because the suburbs were already in use. So it's like a second ring of suburbs. Um you know, in that. So I'm imagining that all those other little breakdowns probably have someone that coined them at some point. So if the listeners did want to go into them and check them all out and see what they are, I mean, they probably all have a definition similar yeah. to that, you know, someone coined to talk about an area. And that's how we fit in different perspectives, you know, when they're looking at trying to figure out the breakdown of America. That's how you're going to be defined in a broad sense. They have a blog. They haven't put a whole lot in the blog. There was, you know, one on January 30th for Trump. It's all about the middle suburbs. And then another one on April 20th. New poll shows Trump-driven divisions in electorate. Shocking. I don't think any of us are really surprised that the the makeup of the country is is very divided in what they want. You know, it, it has very little to do with the politics involved, it's it's literally what they want most. Yeah. In the cities, the type of people that live in cities are very different than the type of people that live on a farm. The whole aspect is different. It's it's almost, you know, again, like I was saying, a mirror image, you know, where left is right and right is left. You know, a totally different kind of thing. But there's more people in the cities. This is a higher number of people. Does it, you know, th- this comes down to the electorate, the electoral college, mm-hmm. and whether or not that's fair. And though I, I dislike the idea of being ruled by the majority, the majority still matters. Because otherwise we wouldn't take votes. And in voting it, it does matter. So all of those people, they do represent a guiding force. Do they have a different aspect than the farmer? Certainly. Absolutely. That's without doubt. But should a farmer's vote outweigh the people that are in a city because that's what the electoral college does. It doesn't make it fair. Right. And in trying to explain that to people, that is where your biggest hurdle is. Yeah. Because there, a lot of the people you're going to have this conversation with are going to say, and you'll hear, well, my vote isn't any more important or less important than anyone else's. And, and that's depending wrong. Depending on where you yeah. live, that's a hundred percent wrong. Yeah, because if you are in, I don't know, let's say, well, we just say Florida. Yeah, if you are in one of the populous mm-hmm. areas of Florida, you know, your vote is going to be hampered by. Well, in know, Florida, our vote is not as important as it is in North Dakota. Well, no, because populate the breakdown percentage-wise of how many people it takes for one of our votes to to have value. Is well, yeah, you know, we need, let's say, as an example, 30,000 people voting one way, you know, for their one electoral college vote versus in North Dakota, where 5,000 people vote that particular way. Well, it's, it's because of the way the electoral college is designed, because all states, regardless of population, get three. Mm-hmm. 
in order for that to happen, based on population, states like Florida lose electors. So we don't have the same number based on population as another state does, based on the rules. The rules are not population-driven. That's where the big disconnect is. And if our population goes up to allow us more votes, it just means that another state loses in that regard. No, because no, we still wouldn't get any more. Because there's only so many electors that can be given, based again on the rules. 538. That's it. That's all the number there is. So in order for there to be a change, you have to add another state. And if that state is small, if that state is very small, then again, no matter what, the smallest state in the union, if they have four people in that state, okay? I mean, a ridiculous number. They still get three electoral college votes. Three. In order for them to get those three, another more populous state has to lose an elector. And that's the case for California, that's the case for New York, and that's the case for, for states like Florida. Where other of the flyover states, I know they don't like that term, but the flyover states in the Midwest, that's why they have the number of electors that they do is because we had to give them electors if you're looking at it purely on a population basis. It's a bad system. It's not equitable. It doesn't make them... It makes them more important than they are in the grand scheme of things. One person in... uh, Montana. That's a good one. One person in Montana is worth at least five people in New York. Does that make it fair to the people in New York? No. And the people in New York didn't want a Trump. So the Electoral College is is, um, bullshit, as far as I can tell. And it's math. It's mathematic. That's why it's bullshit. It doesn't make sense. It isn't equitable. And sure, people are going to complain because they're going to say that the the people's voice in the Midwest, the people that are in the small states, they, they need to matter. Well, sure, they matter. But should they matter more than a single person somewhere else? And almost universally, you're going to, going to hear no. But, of course, if it's on their side, they're not going to say that. Because that's just human nature. So I don't know where, where to go from there. We're not going to get rid of the Electoral College. Probably in my lifetime. I don't see that happening. No, probably not. Yeah. But I think it's a bullshit system. And I've been on the record with that many times. And I'm going on, on it again. Um... Okay, so another website. Um, there's a couple websites that I follow, one of which is uh, a good friend of mine and uh, a partner with a really radio, and that is Epic Progress. And they put out the Trump damage report every day. Um, and they also track the Trump lifestyle taxpayer cost, which I find interesting. This is... Um, it's extrapolated, and the analysis is performed and essentially by The Guardian based on their historical costs and uh, expenses of previous administrations and compiled, therefore. So, as of 429, which was Saturday, the taxpayer cost for Trump's lifestyle to date, up through day 99, day 100, Somewhere in there, a hundred and twenty million six hundred thousand dollars. Just want to let that sink in for a moment. A hundred and twenty million dollars. Hundred and twenty point six 
million dollars for 100 for days of living 100 days of having trump as president i have lived 35 years and a number of days on this planet i could not spend that much in taxpayer dollars if you added up all of the cost right. of living for my life yeah you add zeros based on the obama presidency that's what it takes for Trump's year to date, Obama's yearly was uh, let's see, twelve million. Yearly, twelve point one two five million. Yearly, that includes Biden. So we are. Yeah, adding. I mean, is, that's adding a zero. I was going to say that's ten times. So I mean, is it technically an order of magnitude higher? Uh, what's the definition of order of magnitude? I think that's a logarithmic function, isn't it? I've drank a lot, so I can't pull up that initially. Uh, relative size, quantity, etc. New problem, order of magnitude, arrangement of numbers, uh, each class being a different number, usually, usually 10 greater or smaller than the one before. So yeah, 10 yeah. times. Yeah, so it is an order of magnitude greater Amazingly than what enough, yeah. Obama spent in a year yeah. to survive as president to the taxpayer. That's our taxpayer cost. So now, amazingly enough, we can actually say an order of magnitude different and not be in the, the realm of hyperbole. No. I mean, it. that is fact yeah as much as he may not like that word or <laughs> what it actually implies yeah. it, it is fact that you have spent an order of magnitude more in a hundred days than the previous presidential it's amazing regime did in years absolutely amazing amazing now when they say cost to the taxpayer do we know at what point do we feel that cost? It's hidden. It's it, that's not a number that we'll ever know, because it'll come out of somewhere. Right. It, the thing is, what this will do is it will drive the deficit higher. We will never feel it because we live in a debt society. Right. So all of that money spent will just get tacked onto the national debt. He's and, not paying it down. He's making it go higher. Right. And I guess I didn't mean feel it because obviously we're, it's not like we're going to yeah, get a bill we'll come never, due. We'll never feel it. I just it. meant like at what point, I guess, because I mean, it's all being paid now. Now, the people in West Palm Beach, they will feel it because added security and it is impacting the communities that he is visiting. Yeah. In untold ways. I mean, you know, we, we can see news reports about how the city is going bankrupt because of this or that or whatever. Yeah, so there are trickle-down effects, and they're not pretty. But I'm not seeing any... I don't see anything positive that he has done. I would love for somebody to show me something positive that I can't immediately refute with a simple Google search. I don't I don't get it. I don't know if you live in the group or you have the mindset that anything he wants to do or is attempting to do would be a positive for you. He you're not his target. Well, that is true. So, yeah. If he accomplishes something that someone sees as a positive, they're in a different demographic than you. It's a positive for them. I don't think that you're going to see a whole but lot. But is it? If or is that just perception? Well, the perception is obviously going to be important. Yeah. Because realistically... I'm looking at hard numbers, though. I'm, I'm looking only, at actual benefit. He's only going to do what benefits him. Is, is he, going to be the, done that, yeah. Yeah, the, the realistic you know, implications of his presidency. But... If someone's presenting you something positive, I don't know right now 
that you're going to be able to see it as a positive because it's not going to be geared towards you or your demographic or your girls or, you know, the people that you care about. It's you you just don't live in those circles. You don't exist yeah. in that world that matters to him. I don't know that throughout the time that you will see any of those general benefit things come out of his presidency where someone can step back and be like, you know what, regardless of political stance, this was just a good, like, I don't, I don't know that you're going to see that. I haven't seen any of that. Yeah. And, and a hundred days isn't a huge amount of time. It's, you know, a little less than third of a year and we've got four years to get through still essentially. So, it's a sample size, but it's not a huge one. Maybe we need to be looking at a year and see what's been accomplished and then kind of gauge on that because that's at least a quarter of his time as his presidency, Yeah, hopefully just a quarter. Um, I'm showing on our, uh, on our live stream video, uh, which will now be archived because I don't think many people are watching, but that's okay because it's late and I don't expect you to. Uh, is the Trump damage report for Saturday, April 29th, 2017. Now, many times I have narrated the... Uh, I've, I've gone ahead and read through the Trump damage report, so you've seen that on the feed probably. This is the same stuff. Um, so, just real quick here, let me, let me read through what this is about here. Um, the Whopper King... Blacks for Trump and other lies, marching for facts, EPA torpedoes climate change, golf care, taxes in Candyland, astroturfing FCC, and teacher of the year weirdness. All this and more in your daily Trump damage report for Saturday, April 29th, 2017. Super callous, fragile, ego, exo, extra braggadocious. Mm -hmm. By the way, usually I had to do many, many takes on these, so you're going to just hear it, okay? <laughs> so it takes some time to get these right, but uh, this, is, this is raw. Blacks for Trump. I love that guy. Blacks for Trump. Donald Trump said today, pointing out one of only black people who showed up at his rallies. As in, only one black person showed up at his rallies and said, hey, I love that black guy. That one right there. Before we go any further. Yeah. At his rallies. He's the president. Why is he having rallies? It, it, oh, wait. I, he's running for president still. I was going to ask, like, this isn't something that we saw from other presidents in the past. Like, I don't recall this being a thing. No. Now, granted, so, memory is skewed, and sometimes you remember, you know, you remember or disremember things based on what you're seeing currently, but I don't recall yeah. ever seeing, like, a president that won a hundred days in still holding rallies with his supporters like he is still running for president. But he is still running for president. He already logged in that he's running for re-election. How? No president before has ever done that. It's unprecedented. <laughs> Even with that mindset, okay? So you've already filed that you're going to go ahead and run again, which is is great you can do what you want it it doesn't really matter because if the republican party is not thrilled with you they will put someone else out you're gonna have to run off in a primary with them yeah. and you could lose so it doesn't matter what you say now right. but even if you are running for president right now yeah and they don't your rallies aren't helping you because those aren't new people to the cause what it what those it does is it reinflates his ego because we've seen stories where he was feeling downtrodden or whatever, and he had to go downstairs, and he had to see the people that were rallying there for him, and then that boosted his ego again, and then he could go back and face the world. He is so fragile. This is what it takes for him to go through the day. It's ridiculous. The amount of ego stroking that he has. He does not have a thick skin. Well... Which is insane. I take that back. Maybe he does. Maybe he does. Maybe he does have a thick skin. But beyond that thick skin, he has that ego that can be bruised. And in order for him to perk himself back up, this is his drug. Yeah, people have to hoorah for him in, in yeah. crowds. He's addicted to it. So, 
Okay, moving on. Thousands of protesters swarmed Washington, D.C. this weekend for the People's Climate March to take on Trump's anti-science policies, CNN reports. The previous weekend saw the March of Science outnumber Trump's inauguration crowds, pushing for acceptance of science facts in governing. Trump and his administration have rejected most evidence, scientific consensus, and internationally accepted facts on science matters like climate change. We were speaking about that a bit on the previous show, uh, previous show segment, uh, talking about ReasonCon and about the scientists and science educators that uh, that chose to to run from their their speaking engagement directly to a science march or vice versa. So, it's it's a thing. It's a big thing. People would like some fa- some facts and want to follow facts. Makes sense. Trump's EPA has removed climate change science site from public view, the Washington Post reports. They replaced the site with a redirect towards an issue page on energy independence via Trump's coal-burning clean power plan, which, as you might have guessed, is not about anything clean. Earlier today, Trump said, We have ended the war on beautiful clean coal. Clean coal is like good cancer. It doesn't work that way. (sighs) <sighs> There's more than three jobs for every one job in coal in in artif- in solar mm-hmm. energy. Just solar. renewables, yeah. And I'm being conservative in that number. It's going up every day. More people are needed to install solar panels to regulate all this industry. It's it's insane. Coal's dead. It's been dead. It needs to stay in the ground. Leave it there. Trump, attempting to defend his frequent taxpayer-funded golfing habits that have eclipsed all previous administrations by orders of magnitude at this point, as we know, which is times 10, says, I couldn't care less about golf, the Hill reports. Yeah, we know. Following in Trump's footsteps, Trumpist Republican candidate Greg Giaforte has hundreds of thousands of dollars invested in U.S.-sanctioned Russian companies, The Guardian reports. Yay. Russia. He hasn't been able to, to shake the stigma. That's still there. A hundred days in, and it's worse. Why wouldn't it be? You Why? Why would it go away, or why would yeah, it like be worse? Why, like why why wouldn't he be able to shake, or or why why would he be able to shake the stigma? Nothing has been only if it wasn't real, right? Nothing has been definitively proven. Yeah, it is just obfuscated fact, obfuscated fiction, whatever it is. It's there's this veil that yeah. they're never gonna let us see through, and there are people that just don't care. And then there are the people that really, really care because it's important, mm-hmm. and we're just never going to get the answers we want. So, no, like, there's no reason to let that go. It should hang on everything he does. If he eats alphabet soup and the, they fucking accidentally spell Russia, <laughs> it should be commented on. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Yeah, it, I agree. Just, it, it's not... Don't there, let it go. Don't let are, it be normal. There are some things that... You know, if they happen, it can be like, you know what, we're just, you know, the taxes. Yeah. Okay, that's something that it's just not going to happen. You got to let it go, move on, find the other things that he's going to do wrong or, you know, screw up or that he can improve on. You know, offer him examples of ways to be better. Yeah. You know, that's that's great. But some things you're just going to have to let go. This is one. No, it should never be let go. If it gets to a point where he's running for re-election, it should be brought up then. It should be hammered on then. Yeah. You know, the fact that there is audio of him saying, you know, uh, yeah, you have to ask your questions. Russia is a ruse. And you have multiple people in your cabinet that have had to leave your cabinet because of their ties with Russia. That's true. What ruse are you talking about? Where did those guys go? Yeah. Where do you think they went? I'm very curious. Like he's if I could so good down, at deflecting. Yeah. He is so good. I mean, if there's anything that he's really good at, it is deflecting the conversation. It's, well, and this is, 
He's super brash and he doesn't care. He'll talk right over you. Yeah. So it's not it's deflecting, but it's also in that those people are just letting him deflect. Like it would be really weird in like a one-on-one interview that the person isn't pandering to him. It would be a lot harder unless he f- was, you know, flat out I'm not going to do this anymore and got up and left. Because in a one-on-one interview, you could hammer him over and over and over again. Yeah. I'd be like, I get what you're saying. It's not answering the question. Where do you think those guys went? Do you think they're still in your cabinet? Explain to me why they're not there. I mean, that's it, it's that kind of thing. Like, I'm very curious to know yeah. what his actual view is on those people that left because you'll never get the straight answer. No, we need a legitimate prosecutor on this. Yeah. Yeah. A dark money conservative group is bombarding the Trump-led FCC with comments favoring the dismantling of net neutrality, setting up enough astroturf for Trump's FCC administrator to point to as evidence of public support, Vice reports. So they're using their money as speech. Mm -hmm. They're creating false comments. And saying it's what the people want. Right. This is what you get from money is speech. When money talks, bullshit walks. Kruger's of the New York Times slaps down Trump with what it's like working in the administration in an op-ed today. Every report from inside the White House conveys the impression that Trump is like a temperamental child, bored by details and easily frustrated. That's about as spot on as it gets. And I mean, it, what I like is, is very vague reports yeah. from in the White House. Reports from Trump's mouth. Yeah. He's obviously very easily frustrated. Again, I, I made mention of it earlier, but several times he has said, well, this is a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. Exactly. That's yeah. never said in a way. No. It's never said with a chipper tone. Like, you do not run into somebody and like, man, this is a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. It is always defeatist. It, yeah. it is always petulant yeah. every single time it's ever said. It's an excuse. Yeah. It's an excuse. Always an excuse. Uh, childbirth is a lot harder than I thought it would be. You know, wh- having witnessed it. Thankfully, I didn't have to go through it. But, yeah, th- things of that nature, yeah. you know, it's definitely an excuse. <laughs> the five biggest actual fake news stories Trump has pushed on America ranked by Vice. His inauguration crowd was the biggest ever. There was significant voter fraud during the election. Liberal imposters have infiltrated town halls in red districts. People are paid to protest Trump. And Obama wiretapped Trump. I got to say that that, go. that um, number five should be number one. Like, I don't know if those were listed in, in no any particular order. order. Probably no yeah. particular order. Yeah. Maybe maybe in time. Those happened in, in sequential order, I think. Trump had a super weird meeting with the 2017 Teachers of the Year, the Washington Post reports. Trump had earlier posted, uh, proposed a gargantuan 14% cut to education in the United States kept the families of the teachers sequestered in a hot room, had the teachers sing happy birthday to his wife, and remain seated the entire time. It was cringe-inducing and incredibly weird. <sighs> yeah, it's just like sigh. David Smalley sigh. Yeah, I mean, he's, yeah. not, <laughs> he's not conducive to being around people. <laughs> and yet the job requires that he is occasionally oh. around people or less than occasionally more than occasionally more than occasionally the, the job is people people the job is people well you know it's representing all the people should be um yeah but yeah it just the things i i can't envision and again i've only been politically aware through like the second half of Bush on real, okay. you know, yeah. like paying attention, but I just, I can't envision even Bush's screw ups were like, Oh, that guy, he's, you know, he's just, he's just a little, he's a little dumb. He's just, you know, chopping broccoli, you know, yeah, that, yeah. SNL stuff, you know, yeah. But 
they were never this. You know, if he had people in, he was respectful. He was dignified. He, you know, he did the statesman thing. He had yeah. his father to fall back on. He ran Texas. You know, his his brother, good or bad, ran Florida. You know, like he had those things as he an had, example. He had big gaffes, but he never looked like this. No, he never unpolished, never no. completely lost. I mean, everything he does is a drowning man defiantly not seeking a life preserver. Yeah. Like, no, I'm good. No, you're drowning. Proud no, proud I'm of drowning. Good. I proud am of the drowning, best yeah. drowning victim you have ever seen. That's right. This will be the best death you ever seen. I'm out of this drowning. That's right, yeah. Uh, and last, fact check has assembled a minor compilation of 100 Days of Lies from the Trump administration, holding on to the title King of the Whoppers, as falsehoods go. And I'm just going to roll right over to that. 100 Days of Whoppers is yeah. the title of the fact check op um, piece. Um, Donald Trump, whom we crowned the King of Whoppers when he was a long shot candidate in 2015, has held true to form during his first 100 days as President of the United States. Oh, there's a video. Hmm. They have 100 days of actual lies in montage form. Let me see if I can get that video. It's like Rocky training to fight the Russians, but instead it's Rocky training to hug the Russians. Ha! Huh. <laughs> That's that's funny right there. Uh, that's not what I wanted. I want control C. Control paste. There we go. Let's see if I can... Well, actually, if I play it from right here, it doesn't matter. I, I can actually have everybody see it. Okay, so play. And the crime, and the gangs, and the drugs that have stolen too many lives and robbed our country of so much unrealized potential. This American carnage stops right here and stops right now. So I'm guessing okay, that was so, a lie because it didn't stop right there and right now. Right, that was a lie because, in fact, the U.S. violent crime rate in 2015, the most recent full year on record, was less than half what it was at its peak in 1991. And then it continues on. Okay, so it tells you why each one was a lie after. Yeah. How long um, is the video? Like it's... four hours? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's six minutes. <laughs> it's six minutes. Uh, and was expected to increase about 3% in 2016 based on preliminary reports. Uh, so that was from his inauguration, and then it continued on as it went. President Trump on inauguration. I made a speech. Size. I looked out. The field was, it looked like a million, a million and a half people. This was the largest audience to ever witness an inauguration, period both in person and around the globe. Yeah, it really wasn't, but it was not, as clearly shown in the crowd photos of the 2017 and 2009 events showed. Uh, then they show the, the pictures side by side. 2009 was at least triple President Trump's vote, voter fraud claims. Without evidence, Trump tells lawmakers 3 million to 5 million illegal ballots cost him the popular vote. Three million, just about the number of three million to five million. Lost. Yeah, uh, he tweeted out, "I will be asking for a major investigation into voter fraud, including those registered to vote in two states." Uh, which we found out many of the people in his administration Steve Bannon, were. Ivanka, Kushner, exactly. And I believe Bannon was actually registered in three states. Yeah, which happens when people move. You just don't vote in those three states. Yeah, I mean that's the thing is. If I were to leave Florida, I'm still a registered voter here. Right. It doesn't immediately dissolve when I leave the state. Yeah. I would still be a registered voter. Yeah. There was no evidence of, of any such massive fraud at the time, and none has been produced since then. Uh, President Trump on his travel ban. Uh, my policy is similar to what Obama did in 2011. That's what he was trying to say. Uh, but it's not. Trump's order temporarily prohibited entry of visitors from seven predominantly Muslim countries and indefinitely banned all refugees from Syria. 
and we've talked about Syria, and there's been a lot of talk about Syria, about how bad that was and is. Uh, by contrast, the Obama administration tightened the screening process for refugees from one country after discovering that two Iraqis living in Kentucky had been involved in a roadside bombing attack on U.S. troops in Iraq. So it's it's nothing like what Obama did. No. So just a flat-out lie. It's so just bad. Obama did not ban Iraqi refugee, refugees, but uh, there were delays. He delayed everything. But that, Then that, in sanctuary cities... I was going to say, that kind of misinformation is the hallmark or the benchmark of, you know, right now the Republican Party or this presidency yeah. in that you'll see those things. You know, in, in this particular instance, you have to actually do the research to understand what provoked President Obama's, you know tightening of the restrictions at that time, the fact that it wasn't a ban, it was just tightening of... I mean, all of these little nuanced things that you have to do the research. And another example of that is with the wall. And what you'll hear a lot of them say, and when I say them, I mean like Republicans or those in the presidential, is they'll compare it to when um, also during Obama's tenure and voted on, I believe, by Hillary Clinton, um, when they voted to um, provide funding to the current existing border fences sure. to to essentially beef them up, repair them, take care of them. Yeah. Um, and then they added a bit of, you know, a stretch to one of them. Um, and so that vote went through and they approved it. And it'll get compared. And it's like, well, th these are two separate things. One of them is a lot more nuanced. You have to look into it. We're talking right. about a fence in an area that already has a fence along it. Some of that money is going to repairing the fence as it exists, you know, maintenance, which is obviously going to have to happen when you have right. something, you know, in, in place like that. Any so existing infrastructure has to be maintained. It's yeah. like they have the these allergies to nuance. A, a headline, <laughs> An allergy to nuance. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. A headline That's good. is perfectly fine because you can just highlight the headline like oh look look at this money they gave to a border yeah. wall well what are you talking about what does the actual story say well no 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 it's just this well no you realize that that's just a headline like there's actually more if you look yeah i have found a lot of a lot of that allergy to nuance in trump supporters in general they don't want to hear the rest of the story they're apparently not paul harvey listeners yeah, that was not, not something that they ever liked, apparently. Right. Though maybe if Paul Harvey actually had told them the rest of the story about things like this, they, they might listen. Possibly. Yeah, maybe my dad would. You know, what would Paul Harvey say about all this? Is your dad still not listening to nuance? And I mean, is, is he one of the people who's looking at this as a successful 100 days? <sighs> like. Or, or do you not have those conversations as much right now? <laughs> It's been difficult to try and get those conversations in because my mother doesn't want to hear any of it. Understandable. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to blame she, her. And anytime, well, because, and and this is the this is the sign of a losing argument when you don't ever want to talk about it. If you were winning, you talk about it all the time. Yes. If you're losing, you want to say, "I don't want to talk about that right now." So, kids. Folks at home, listeners, viewers, when you're winning, you, you can know that you're winning when the other side doesn't want to talk anymore. When they haven't given you any good arguments, but they simply never want to talk about it anymore, you are winning. So, on to winning. Uh... So, President Trump on sanctuary, sanctuary cities. Sanctuary cities. Uh, as you know, I'm very much opposed to sanctuary cities. They breed crime. There's a lot of problems. But university researchers who studied the claim continued con found that we find no statistically discernible difference between the violence, crime rate, rape, or property crime in sanctuary cities. Among cities that honor federal requests to detain unauthorized immigrants and those that don't. So he's just wrong. And then the dishonest press. Radical Islamic terrorists are determined to strike our homeland as they did on 
as they did from Boston to Orlando to San Bernardino. And all across Europe, you've seen what happened in Paris and Nice. All over Europe, it's happening. It's gotten to a point where it's not even being reported. And in many cases, the very, very dishonest press doesn't want to report it. Uh, that's nonsense, says Fact Jack. <laughs> The White House later produced a list of 78 allegedly unreported terrorist attacks, which included five receiving uh, days of wall-to-wall coverage. It's, yeah, it's, it's just wrong. I mean, they were even saying that here in Orlando that nothing happened. But, you know, we live here. We know better. Yeah. You know, that was, that was definitely Everywhere. in the press. Uh, some of the White House list really did get little to no coverage, but they were far in the far flung locations that generally didn't result in any deaths anyway. Well, I, and I remember um, one of the things that they talked about in regards to um, after the, the poll shooting happened, um, you know, oh, it didn't get covered by the media. And the Orlando Sentinel actually responded to that by sending him links yeah. to the stories, like the full page stories and, and all of the, you know, the different coverage that they had provided just themselves like oh we we didn't cover that you know here oh here, here's what we covered uh, a few on the list were not terrorist attacks at all according to law enforcement officials but merely involved attackers with arabic names nice well and then the completely made up ones that you know like bowling green massacre oh yeah 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 it's we probably should cover have something that never never remember the bowling green massacre <laughs> Uh, President Trump on Sweden and refugees. We've got to keep our country safe. You look at what's happening in Germany. You look at what's happening last night in Sweden. Sweden. Who would believe this? Sweden. No one. They no one would believe this. Numbers. They're having problems like they never thought possible. So, but there were no terrorist attacks last night, and there's no evidence of a major crime wave in Sweden. Trump said later that he was referring to an appearance he saw on Fox News by a documentary maker whose film had been disputed as a distortion by the very Swedish police officers it featured. So, lies on top of lies on top of more lies uh obama was tapping my phones uh terrible just found out obama had my wires tapped in trump tower just before the victory nothing found this is mccarthyism that was a tweet by uh the tweeter in chief i'd bet a good lawyer would make a good case out of that fact of president obama tapping my phones in october how low has president obama gone to tap my phones during a very sacred election process. <laughs> These are all tweets. Uh, Trump offered no evidence to support that wild claim, and in the days following, none came to light elsewhere. It's respect just to the president's tweets over and over. About alleged wiretapping directed at him by the prior administration, I have no information that supports those tweets, and we have looked carefully inside the FBI. The Department of Justice has asked me to share with you that the answer is the same for the Department of Justice and all its components. Then claiming pre- credit for President Obama's Job stuff. Reports, since I took the oath of office, we've already added nearly half a million new jobs. But half of those jobs were added under Obama before Trump t- took the oath of office on January 20th. The uh, BLS survey... Uh, payroll survey measures jobs as of the pay period containing the 12th day of the month. Uh, then President Trump's false Many Obamacare claims. And brightest are leaving the medical profession entirely because of Obamacare. Now, I've actually heard that. And I've heard it from physicians that many are leaving. Now, what Fact check found, factcheck.org. Actually, the total number of active physicians has increased nearly 8% under the health care law, according to the Association of American Medical Colleges. So that's, uh, I guess I only work with older doctors. 
Well, and a lot of those doctors were of the age that they could retire, and they found it that it was just easier to retire than get with a new program. Well, and, that, and that's what I was going to say is yeah. what Fact Check may have found and what you were hearing because uh, obviously you work within the medical um, yeah. profession. Uh, you work with medical professionals on a daily basis. Um, so it, it doesn't have to mean what you're hearing is incorrect. Right. It's just what you're hearing isn't the whole story. Exactly. There's yep. the nuance that you have to pay attention to the whole thing. How many of those, like you said, are older doctors mm-hmm. that are just at that retirement age? Or most even of them. still, hey, people may just be, you know what, I don't want to get with this. I don't yeah. want to do this anymore. But how many other people are coming in? It'd be the same as saying, yes, so many Americans are dying every day. Yeah. And our population is just going to fall off. Soon there's not going to be anybody left. Let me just say that there were also doctors that weren't hurting for money. Right. These are doctors that could afford to say, I don't need to do this anymore. So a lot of a lot of your doctors out there that you might have had since you were a kid, that your parents have gone to for years and years and years, they might have said, you know, now is a fine time to retire. Because I don't want to have to go through that. Because part of the Obamacare thing, and a lot of people weren't taking this into account, was that there was a mandate, essentially, to go to electronic records, Mm. which changes the entire dynamic of a doctor's office and forces them to do it. However, the ACA also included funds to help them do it. But still, even after that was done, many doctors are super old school. They don't trust computers. They're freaking Luddites. Yeah. They don't trust it at all. So it's the myth of the paperless office, having worked in IT for oh, a really long time, folks. A really long time I've been in IT. Um, ever since I've heard the, the term paperless office, I've seen more paper year over year accumulate in offices. I have not seen one office that has generated less paper. Now, I run... Never imaging for a paperless lawyer's office. Right. Um, paperless my ass. Uh, I have a lot of paper. Yeah. I have to keep <laughs> track of a lot of paper. You know, because once I make it paperless, I'm still holding on to that paper for 30 days. And then exactly. I can get rid of that paper. But you know what replaced it? More paper. Yeah. At some point. <laughs> then a piece of paper saying that it's now in the digital system somewhere. It's like, really? <laughs> How does that work? Yeah, I I am fully on board with I like I said I I'm mm-hmm. in a paperless office right now that I'll tell you there's a shitload of paper in that office. Yeah, it just doesn't happen. I mean, it, it's a myth. So, moving along with this so that we can get it done. Um, so that was just reiterating President Trump on President Obama's Syrian weaknesses. Uh, so then this is a a press release. Um, by the White House, these heinous actions by the Bashir al-Assad regime are a consequence of the past administration's weakness and irresolution. President Obama said in 2012 that he would establish a red line against the use of chemical weapons and then did nothing. Um, That was out on April 4th, 2017, for those that are curious. Uh, And then moving on, come on. on. Did Fact Check have a... Then Fact Check says... But back then, Trump himself urged Obama to stay out of the conflict. Well, there's that, but there's a whole lot more to that. Oh, there's there's a lot, yeah. When when you're looking at that, um, you know, they had, he urged the the red line, but then what he did instead of what Trump did was he then went to Congress and said, this is what I want to do. Right. And Congress he sought said, approval from Congress right. first. And Congress said no, because the approval rating for Obama to do anything with Republicans at the time yeah. was 28%. There yeah. was no way he was going to get anything done, because unfortunately he had a Congress he had to fight the whole time. So Congress decided nothing was going to get done, not Obama. Right. And the only way for him to have done anything would have been a one-time deal, just like Trump did Just here, like Trump has where done. Where he doesn't yeah. have to... 
get approval for it. He could just do it. Yeah. Anything further than this, he's going to have to get approval. Otherwise, he's walking the line of violating rules within, you know, the I believe constitutional rules, um, where he has to get a certain amount of approval. Um, and then when you look at those same Republicans, mainly because a lot of them are the same Republicans, um, when they're asked about Trump's decision to just go ahead and do it, their approval rating is like 80%. What we're, what you're looking at there and what a lot of people don't know about is the War Powers Resolution, also known as the War Powers Resolution of 1973 or the War Powers Act. Um, it's a federal law intended to check the president's power to commit the United States to an armed conflict without the consent of the U.S. Congress. The resolution was adopted in the form of a U.S. Congress joint resolution. It provides that the U.S. president can send U.S. armed forces into action abroad only by declar declaration of war by Congress statutory authorization, or in case of a national emergency created by attack upon the United States, its territories or possessions, or its armed forces. The War Powers Resolution requires the President to notify Congress within 48 hours of committing armed forces to the military action and forbids armed forces from remaining for more than 60 days, within a fur with a further 30 days withdrawal period. Without, co without a congressional authorization for use of military force or a declaration of war by the United States. The resolution was passed by a two-thirds Congress overriding the presidential veto. Uh, it has been alleged that the War Powers Resolution has been violated in the past, for example, by President Bill Clinton in 1999 during the bombing campaign in Kosovo. Uh, Congress has disapproved of such incidents, but none has resulted in any successful legal actions being taken against president for alleged violations. So essentially, what this allowed, in loophole fashion, was a president to act unilaterally for up to 60 days with a promise to then remove them after that. Anywhere in the world, whatever it happens to be, without any authorization by Congress. Yep. It's essentially a blank loan check. And he doesn't even have to tell them beforehand. He's Absolutely got 48 not. hours yeah. to tell them once they've been yeah. you know, sent where they're going. So you send them where they're going. Two days later, you're going and you're like, oh, hey, by the way, right. we've totally got military. Which would be, I'm thinking, pretty close to impossible to actually pull off just because of the amount of coverage. You know, if we had like a now, mass mobilization. Now, yes, but not during 19, yeah, not yeah, in 1973. Not, I was say, not in 1973, but now the mass mobilization it would be picked up somewhere and reported on. Oh, yeah. Hey, a bunch of our troops just left, you know, Fort Hood in Texas, and they flew off this right. way. You know, like, um, so it would at least be reported on or speculated, or there would be a lot more attention paid to it. But yeah. yeah. You could just send people somewhere, wait the two days, go and tell Congress and be like, I'll totally have them out of there in 60 days. Something like that, yeah. Or they'll be done fighting and on their way home within ninety. You know, like yeah. technically. Well, really, all all the all that the president, the you know, executive in chief of the United States Armed Forces, all that he would have to have to do is say, "This is an evolving situation. I do not have all the information. I am awaiting further confirmation from our armed forces on the scene." And because they have that. 60 day period in which at, at which point they then have 30 day period mm -hmm. to withdraw that is 90 days to drum up the support to try and get a right. declaration of war right so that's the that's the war powers resolution that's what the president has to deal with he can do whatever he wants for up to 60 days he has to talk about it he has to tell them within two but he can still do whatever he wants right so that's the loophole. And that's what President Obama decided not to do. Right. He, he decided to. Now, he didn't necessarily do the right thing. He could have acted. He could have done something. He might have saved a lot of lives. He might have killed a lot of people. Hard to say because it's all in the past now. But he had the option. He could 
have just done it and then asked forgiveness later. But instead, he put it on Congress to make the decision. It's a very politically shrewd move. It removes him from the chain of disaster. He's still going to get credit for it one way or the other because he's the president. Right. So it doesn't really matter. But he can always then say, I was restricted by Congress. They told me not to. And or given that I and given, given that I answer to them as well as the, the rest of the of the American people, I felt that it was right to go to them and have them make the call. They chose not to make the call. So really, it was the politically strategic thing to do. Right. Not necessarily the right thing to do. And but politically Mwah, completely beautiful. ignores the fact that then throughout his presidency ordered up plenty of drone strikes. Yeah, sure. We bombed in Syria plenty of times. Yes. You know, that I mean there to say those things completely ignores anything that then came after. Right. And completely ignores the situation at the time. It's, so actually that kind of makes me wonder what was different about that time than all the other times that he still acted unilaterally. What was the date on... I don't know. Um, that, 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 does, that does bring up bring that point up. Like, I wonder. Uh, Going to have to look at that, I think. Where is it? Without knowing the date off the top of my head, I'm still... Like, my thought would be it was probably among the first instances of really having to deal with Syria in that way? It was in 2013 when the Syrian regime crossed the red line. Um, hmm. Okay, so just into his second term. Oh, Twitter's not coming up? What the hell? Oh, dot Twitter. They put in a bad address. There we go. So let's see. What's this? Obama. So back in September 11th, September 11th, 2013, uh, Donald Trump tweeted, Obama must now start focusing on our country jobs, health care, and all of our many problems. Forget Syria and make America great again. Oh, he started that make America great again thing a long time ago. Yep. Hmm. Way back then. That's interesting. Oh, jeez. That's hilarious. Okay, so interesting that it was on 9-11. But we've seen a lot of things happen on 9-11 um, in that same vein right. over and over. Um, so that's that's curious. That's curious. So I wonder exactly what happened there. We'll have to we'll have to dig deeper. And if you happen to have some insight into that, some some insider information, or just have a longer memory than uh, than we do, you know, let us know about that. And unfortunately, then that made me reset the uh, 100 days video. Let me see where that was. That's the wiretapping. They took present credit for the jobs, payroll, medical profession, almost there. And then the 2013. Oh, and 2012, he said there. Okay, interesting. So there's 2012 and then 2013. Um, tweeting a dozen times. So stuff was apparently happening. Oh, and that's actually it. Um, stuff was apparently happening uh, at a, a pretty breakneck pace back in 2012 and 2013 about Syria and what was going on there. It's been a hotbed for quite some time, obviously. So, uh, Fact Check basically finds that uh, he is a, a enormous uh, liar, liar, pants on fire about most of his everything. 
And there's still the nepotism charges, uh, the emoluments clause, you know, all these things that are still hanging over his head. And amazingly, he seems to be completely impervious to it. All of these things, just one of which, if it was hanging over the head of any previous president, would doom him. He's got a litany of problems. 99 troubles and, what, Melania ain't one of them? I don't know. It's bad. No, I would still say she's one of them. She might be one of them. <laughs> she's got to be part of the $120 million taxpayer cost because she's not <laughs> living in the right. White House. Yeah, because... They're essentially separated. Yeah, paying security to take care of her in their gold-laden New York penthouse. Yeah. And talking about Ivanka and Jared Kushner and the Bannon thing is just weird. Trying to figure out where where he stands now. It's been it's been a tumultuous one hundred days. Yep. And I don't really see any signs of it getting lighter or better in any way. So you asked, you know, whether or not those conversations are happening with my parents. And I would like them to happen with my parents. I don't know that I'm going to get them to happen with them. Because I, they're, the, they're the closest conservatives that I have that I could talk to. Right. And really, I just want to ask, uh, so how do you think he's doing? 100 days in. How do you think he's doing? Because they don't want to talk to me about it. Because they don't really want to examine it. You know, their guy's in, and that's all that's important to them. But he's not doing anything good. He's not doing... He's not being successful. And he's certainly not making America great again. My dad actually, um, a couple weeks ago... um, we started the conversation, but we couldn't get into it. We couldn't finish it. And it was, it was kind of like, well, what kind of America do you want? And that's, that's the real crux of it. What do you want America to be? And I, I started to go into what I wanted, and then, of course, children got in the way and, you know, pool time and things like that. Right. So that, that didn't happen. And he never, uh, it never, never rolled back around to him. But I really want to know, what do you want America to look like? Now, because... What does a great America look like to you? Please describe this, this entity, this dreamland of yours. And let's see if it actually matches to what I want. Because right. it might. Because we, we might have the same goals in mind, but completely different avenues how to get there. And I think that's probably the case. But I don't know. What, what question would you ask a conservative? Well, before, And audience, what, what question would you ask a conservative? You before know, I even I, you know, I get to that... Um, in regards to the conversation with you and your dad, because mm-hmm. you don't get to that point of being able to really have them because your mom doesn't want to hear it yeah. currently. And, you know, I'm sure there are more than one reason for that right now. Yeah. Um, do you think that if you were able to, like, you know, like maybe like you and your dad went and did like a lunch somewhere, would that be more conducive to being able to have the conversation? Mm, yeah, then probably. It would be the two of you sitting down, you could. You know, whatever you want. There are no kids to worry about at that time. You don't have to worry about bothering your mom with the conversation yet again. You yeah. Know, that, that type of thing where, where maybe you would want to consider that just so that you can get the answer or at least get yeah. that dialogue past the point of frustration. Um, oh, I, I don't think it would be past the point of frustration, but it would, it would at least uh, frustration, it, would, it would change the environment for yeah, the conversation. Frustration in the sense of you yeah. want to have the conversation, but you're consistently unable to have it that would be frustrating to me oh Um, yes for myself and this may be a situation to where um i need to let go you know like we were talking earlier sometimes you just have to let things go i am still very stuck on how did you get to the point that none of the things highlighted in the run to the presidency disqualified him as a candidate for you. I'm still stuck on that. 
Like, but that's simple. That's I've, that's simple. I never had that answered. Once he became the candidate for the GOP, and Hillary became the candidate for the DNC. That's all it took, because it was Hillary. And so mine may even go further than that, because yeah. he had to have been picked as the candidate. Yeah, but they didn't have any option in that. They weren't, they weren't delegates. They weren't there at the primary. They couldn't choose the runoff. Uh, in every situation, Trump was not the guy for my parents. Until no, no, he no. was the guy for the party. Yeah, no, no. I'm not talking about your parents. You would ask, what would I ask a conservative? Yeah, I know. But that, it's similar in many regards to that. You know, also, we looked at the cavalcade of chaos that was the cacophony of conservatism. Of all the clown car candidates. Mm-hmm. I don't know how many more C's I can put in there. But there was... A <laughs> Yeah. There was so many. There was twenty two at the beginning, and and all of is ridiculous. And all of them had their issues. Yes, but if you're telling me that I could be dealing with the potential of a President Cruz right now, who that I am aware of has never groped females because he could do what he wants and has never we barely have evidence that he's actually touched a female so right. yes yeah and has never been sued for racial discrimination right in housing practices you know like i don't have these misogynist and and racist things yeah to look at it would just be much the, less damaging the crappy religious stuff yeah and then the ultra conservative views that don't Always, yeah. Cruz is an ult ultra conservative dominionist, and so which is all sorts of bad. Look up dominionism, folks. If you uh, were to it's crazy. ask me to choose between which one I wanted, I'll ride out the storm with Cruz because I have an idea of of where things are going. You know, I know what's going to happen. He's yeah, but that's another reason why people didn't want him. Why people didn't want a establishment candidate. They wanted somebody unpredictable. They wanted somebody not of that bend to shake things up. So I guess... I don't know why they had to pick an oligarch. I was going to say, so I guess that would be what I would ask a conservative, is in moving forward, because this no longer matters. This is the world we live in. You know, that, like that's, that's where we are now. I think I know. I think I know. Keep going. In moving forward... What is it that you are looking for? Because you can't keep picking the furthest from what exists in politics now. So, so what is it that you're looking for that would be establishment politician, but okay for you to not continually put us in these situations where we go from Trump Ooh. to worse to worse to worse because you're not happy with this solution, you know. Yeah. Where do you go from here? Basically. Yeah, just where do you go from here? I, I, I was doing some research on this, you know, still trying to get into the mind of the voter that would choose a Trump. You know, not necessarily Trump, but a Trump, somebody like him. Right. And I was trying to think of, okay, why would a downtrodden, lower middle class to poverty level person vote for a billionaire at all. Somebody that is so far outside of their class that they don't understand them at all. They can't understand them. Just trying to figure that out. And one of the, one of the things that stood out to me was that the American ideal, the American dream is that there are no poor, no poor people. There are only inconvenienced millionaires. Right. Everyone thinks that they are a lottery ticket away from the good life. And that is what most of America has been brought up with. That anyone can be a millionaire. And that the people that have managed to become 
staggeringly wealthy should be listened to, should be trusted, because they're smart. They obviously managed to get there somehow. So if I just emulate them, if I'm like them, then I too will have some of those millionaire dollars rub off on me. It's a terrible, vicious cycle, and it's wrong. It feeds directly into that allergy to nuance that yeah. we wonderfully coined earlier. You, you got that. That's yours. Um, in that it is truly what the broad version of the American, American dream is. That yeah. you can succeed, that you can become ultra wealthy and have this level of life that people would aspire to. Right. But it ignores the fact that so many of them just happen to have the right idea at the right time. Oh, yeah, yeah. It is a level of luck Happenstance. that gets ignored like these people are... like. Yeah, they were visionary enough to have the idea, but they also had to have the idea at the right time. And that doesn't mm. make them... Like but we said. also idolize sports stars. People that just through a balance of talent, of raw... Their DNA was such that made them a good player in whatever sport they happen to be in. That's what made them wealthy. But I think that's a little different. And, it plays into it, though, and, well, because it, it feeds into the narrative that anyone can come from any roots and become a millionaire, become wealthy. Well, I mean, it, it absolutely does. But when you're looking at something like a sports star, I can idolize a baseball player and recognize, like, holy crap, that is a one-time convergence of talent mm -hmm. that... You know, and then he goes on and he's able to do those things and then be like, well, I mean, anybody can do that. And then I go and do it. And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah no, no, that's a one time convergence of talent because I'm trying to do those same exact things. And this is not working. I can work my whole life to do those same things yeah. and see that it's not working. Whereas with the other thing, like, let's say a Facebook, for example. Yeah. A Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah. That is an idea that, I mean, if you go back and look at the thing, it wasn't even that visionary because he wasn't even the first person at his school to have the idea. Right. Um, but he had just the right this and that. Right. He made the right soup. Right. And he had yeah. help and everybody kind of worked together and provided the right thing yeah. at the right time. And so all of those other people that were also doing those, some of whom were in a better situation than he was, yeah. didn't. And so it's... it's the no, same, th same thing with Microsoft and Apple. Microsoft came up with the idea for the personal tablet years before. But the technology wasn't at a point that could actually make it work. Feasible. They could make it work normally because they had the courier tablet. They had, they had several great ideas and prototypes in, in the can, but they couldn't make them work as seamlessly as Apple did because the technology level wasn't there right. So it, a lot of things are a, um, a convergence of time, talent, demand, all sorts of things that go into things working for the first time. Why did BlackBerry become a success? Why did the iPhone become a success? It was just the right time for those things to happen. Had things come before them? Sure, Palm Pilot came before them. Did they have a little niche? It had a little niche, but it was a stepping stone. And they couldn't get past the stepping stone. They couldn't hold on to those market advantages. BlackBerry lost its market advantage to the just slate of glass that you talk to. Yep. You know, a lot of things... You know, in, in technology, we can see it. And in sports, we can see it. You know, some people were just ahead of their time, and they, they couldn't hang on to that because the sport hadn't caught up with them or whatnot. Uh, even in politics. Uh, Nixon versus Kennedy. Audio, just audio-wise, not looking, Nixon wiped the floor with him. Yep. But visual, 
once the visual media came into play, the pretty boy Kennedy, he knocked it out of the park. Then all of a sudden you have a presidential idea of what they should look like. Right. You know? Yeah. Um, and, and again, some of these are great examples of what the American dream should be. And yeah. it should be something that people look to and aspire to. And it, it's, but you have to take in that there's going to be a, a level of luck. And somewhere along the line, there are a group of people, and it would be those people that consider themselves distressed millionaires, yeah. that don't realize that. It's just the, well, I've put in the time, or I've done this or i've bought this many lottery tickets why isn't it my turn uh yes the (laughs) uh there's a word privilege yeah entitled entitlement that's what it is yep why isn't it my turn yet yeah to also live this life I'm and entitled then, to this graciousness. I'm I'm entitled to all the all the things that I've seen come before me. And then because they lack the nuance to see that huge distinction, they also lack the nuance to see the distinction between someone like Mark Zuckerberg and like Donald Trump, in which Mark Zuckerberg, ton of money, wildly successful. Of course, yeah. Came from Nowhere near the upbringing that Trump had. Right. And Trump's successes start with money being given to him by family. Yeah. He didn't work for that. There was no buildup of, I came from nothing and now I'm something. He came from everything. I think that most of our listeners would think a small loan is maybe $1,000. Maybe even less. Like $500, $200. Well, depending, $200? Depending, small loan. Depending on who you're asking, like if yeah. you're going to someone and saying, like, hey, I, I need to borrow a little bit of money, I've got this going on, like, yeah, you're probably not going to pass like 500 bucks. Yeah. Because most of, and again, I don't know the, the position of most of our listeners, but to most of our listeners, 500 bucks is probably a significant chunk of change. Yeah. You know, it is a good deal. Like for some people, it may be an entire week's paycheck. Yeah. And then you've got the Trumps where he got a small loan to get him started from his dad. His words, a small loan. And it was in excess of, what was it, $100 million? Uh, it's always, it was at least a million dollars. That, that's all yeah. we have to say. A million dollars is a small loan. There are very That's reports. bullshit. I've heard two million. I've heard 14. Yeah. I've heard more. There, it, a, but, a number with that many zeros yes, behind it. Is never small. Is not a small loan. Because if it that's is, a capital investment, if that's a small loan, yeah, I will take one. Absolutely, right anytime. With with favorable terms towards me, I will take one. <laughs> yes, right pretty, now. pretty please. <laughs> I will also take that money yeah. and immediately do nothing with it, and apparently be a wild success. Yeah, that's all. Ta- oh, look at that! I've got a million dollars. Yep, just a million dollars. I'm a, regular, a millionaire. A regular savings account. Yeah, and you wouldn't do have to do anything nothing with it. And apparently be a wild success. Yeah. Because uh, at that at that point for president based yeah. off the fact that I am a wild success. At that point, money makes money. That's all it takes. Yep. It's interest at that point. I mean I've got um, I got a couple thousand in the bank. Thanks to having a, a tax return and not spending it all right away. Okay? That's that's really what it comes down to. And my bank is actually giving me a few cents a month as interest just for a couple thousand. So make that a million and you're, you are earning money Yep, on money. I mean, there is a level. I don't know if it's a million dollars anymore, but it, it's not much more than that. There is a level that if you hit that much money in just a regular savings account, mm-hmm. you no longer have to earn any other money you could live off just the interest it, it, it'll provide you like 50 60 thousand a year maybe okay. a little bit more like there five percent five percent on a million dollars is fifty thousand dollars a year yeah, like you could five live- i just i just did the math i pulled up a calculator one million times point zero five so as long as you live in the means of someone who makes fifty thousand dollars a year, yeah, you no longer have to touch that million dollars. Yeah, you are a millionaire for the rest of your life. 
Just yeah. don't touch it. Yeah, that's all it takes. Just let it provide you $50,000 a year. You had money. Your yeah. job is having that million dollars. That's, that's all it is. is. Yeah. You live off the dividend. That's all it is. And that's, you know, it's just... I really want to win the lottery now just so I can do that. Leave it in the bank and live off the interest. And the difference being is that while you want to win the lottery to be able to do right. that, you yeah. understand... I understand. It's that wildly one, impossible. You're not entitled to it. No. Two, it's damn near impossible... And right. three, there's a whole bunch of things that would have to align for it to even happen. Right. So it's not you sitting around going, well, why do I want to waste a, do I want to waste a couple dollars on a lottery ticket? Right. Well, I mean, you know, lottery in and of itself is that whole thing. Yeah. Be like, man, w- because you can sit down and see when the Powerball goes to, you know, forty yeah. million dollars, and you're like, damn, what would I do with that money? I think the highest and, I ever saw it was three hundred million. Exactly. Before the, I think they had one that was like five. So I, yeah. I, for some reason, I remember like five. I've got the Google machine. It was in like front half of me. a was... billion dollars. Yeah. And the thoughts, because everybody has the conversation. What would you do with that money? Right. So it's very easy to get in that mindset. But the second half of that conversation is, oh, but I never play because I'd have to buy the ticket. You know, like I'd have to spend the money on the ticket. And for me, yeah, the, the ticket is $2. But you know what I would do with that $2? I could buy a drink and a Snickers bar when I'm hungry. You know, like I... $478 million. The highest that it's ever been? That's one of the highest. That's That's big. Current power. This is uh, when was this? When was this? July thirty first, twenty sixteen, almost a year ago. Current Powerball jackpot has hit four hundred and seventy million, making it one of the largest lottery prizes in U.S. history. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, one winning ticket was sold. I want to make sure that this is not actually playing mute tab. Uh, one winning ticket was sold to couple people in Munford, Tennessee, who appeared on NBC's Today Show, they opted to take their $528.8 million share of the prize in one lump sum, making it $327.8 million. Which I will give anyone listening right now wow. a bit of preemptive fiscal advice. If you ever happen to be lucky enough to win the lottery in this fashion... Lump sum every time. Yeah. Lump sum every time. For lots of reasons, but one of the most important is, if you take the payments and you die, no money for anyone else. Right. Yeah. Because that's when it ends. Yep. Yeah. So if you happen to be of of an older era, then certainly do it. Uh, But also, if with that amount of money, you know, we can talk to, you know, people like Phil Ferguson. Uh, Definitely invested wisely you never have to work again. Nope. I mean, we just did the simple math. at had 5%. Of just a million. 5% of a million. Was 50,000. Yeah. Times 300. I mean, again, even yeah. at the base, times 300 yeah. is you're bringing in millions of dollars. Yeah. Just, I mean, it's just math. Yep. Yeah. It's just math, folks. I mean, it's that, still a lot of money no matter what. I mean, you could let it sit there and you could just give the dividends to your children if you wanted. You know, whatever you wanted to do. Oh, geez, 300 million. Okay, 300. Okay, more zeros. Okay, more zeros. Okay, 300 million times, what do you think? 5%? 6%. If What's sales tax in your area? <laughs> you know? Okay, let's, let's call it 7. 7%. That's two hundred and ten million. Yep, a year, every year, that it sits there. Wait a second, did I do that right? I couldn't have done that right. Oh yeah, you did it right. Three hundred million. More zeros, more zeros. Okay. Times point zero seven. Twenty one, twenty one million. I missed a, I missed a decimal point. Twenty one million a year. In just dividends. And we already looked at one million, at just a, a piddly five percent, giving fifty thousand. Money makes money for these people. 
All they have to do is be wealthy to stay wealthy. They don't now, have to do anything with the money. And when you look at something like that, where that amount of money breeds that amount of money yearly, yeah. every year, without doing anything. Just sitting in a bank, letting the bank have the privilege of loaning it out, because that's where you get interest from. Whereas, They're paying you interest to borrow your money out of the bank and give it to other people for a time. They get more interest, and then they pay you a portion of it. It's loan sharking. And whereas you know? lack of money costs money. Yeah. Because God forbid you don't have enough, they're going to charge you for not having enough, even though it's all insured. The money only goes to the top. And they're going to do everything in their power to not lose, you know, like to right. save as much money as possible. Right. Yeah. You know, to avoid taxes on certain amounts and, and lower taxes across the board yeah. and, at, and at, at levels. It only makes sense for wealthy people to wish to hold on to their money and to not pay anything more about it. I mean, it only makes sense. I can't fault them for that, for seeking to hang on to their money. That's logic. I would do the same thing. Just as is, I'm looking to not spend more money than I have to on things. Take that mindset, add zeros to it, and yeah, it's the same deal. You just have so much more of it to play with. And when you have so much more of it to play with, you end up with more to play with over and over and over again. It's fascinating. Really, when you, when you start to look at it and you realize that these people are just the same schmucks that you are, just they've got more zeros in their account. Yep. With preferably a number in front of it, because that's how math works. Oh, yeah, I have infinite zeros. Yeah, I got infinite zeros. They're just in the wrong way. <laughs> They're in the wrong direction. Oh, so that was 100 days of Trump. Uh, obviously, we could go on. We've been talking about him for over 100 days. My God, we've been talking about him for over 100 days. Oh, jeez, that, that, that hurts. That hurts as it is, and just thinking about it. we're going to continue to talk about him. Yeah, it's not but going away. One of the things that I think maybe will happen or maybe we'll focus on, you know, for, for the listeners, because 100 days of Trump, I mean, like I said, I took a break because it was, it was too much. Um, it's hard. And, and it is very difficult. And there are some things that will never be able to be ignored. We'll have to talk about them. But like Andy said, there are a slate of people that we are going to be working on getting on the show um, mm -hmm. to talk to. Which means that a lot of the conversations are going to be about those people. You know, what yeah. are you doing? What are you working on? Tell us about you, which is going to limit. Yeah. So, so we'll still be talking about Trump, and he's still going to be in there. And also, if you don't want to hear about Trump, tell us what you do want to hear about. That would be super helpful. Yeah. Direct us. Help guide us. Put, point us in a direction. Uh, you know, like, hey, maybe... Mm -hmm. One one show a month, recap all the shit he's done, and the other shows focus on this, this, or this. You know, like yeah. you can guide what the show does, what where we go, what happens, what we talk about. We have no problem with yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it is a soul-crushing thing to talk about politics all the time when it's like this. I understand how bad it is to listen to. Think about how it is to try and sort through it and figure out what's important to talk about. That's, it's hard. This is hard, folks. So if you don't want to hear about this anymore, let us know. If you do want to hear about us, about this in particular, then again, let us know that we're in the right direction. Give us something, because, you know, we're not psychic. We don't have a divining rod. That, that stuff doesn't work. We need actual input, because we rely on facts here at O'Reilly Radio whenever possible. So please do that for us. And I think... Um, I think that's really going to call it to a close. Fred, do you have anything else to, to share with our audience before we, we let them depart with their sanity intact, hopefully? I mean, you'll go over it in, in the outro, but one thing I would really like, um, you know, if you, you don't want to direct the show or maybe you don't, you don't get around to that email or you don't feel comfortable directing mm -hmm. the show, um, like probably the most important thing you can do is if you could take the time to go on iTunes and actually give us a review. Yeah. Um it's it is super important. I mean, you may hear other shows talk about it all the time and we don't normally say much except in the outro, but it is hugely important. If you can go on, give us a, a really good review, five stars. Each one of those 
provides iTunes with a reason to show us to more people. And once they show us to more people, then those people may listen and they may review us and it continually moves us up rankings yeah. so that more people can hear us and then maybe they help direct the show in a certain direction. And so it may, may be a way that you want the show to go, but you just, you know, you can't bring yourself to engage or you don't feel like it's your place, but, you know, yeah. someone else does. iTunes is, is vitally important to a podcaster in getting out there and being heard. So if you could do that for us, that would be amazing. Yeah, we're not trying to make a lot of money here or anything. We don't don't have advertisers. I've got some Patreon supporters, and they're they're there hopefully to offset the cost because I'm bringing this to you out of my own pocket. You know, I'm I'm going to ReasonCon out of my own pocket. I'm producing little buttons, which for those of you that are curious, uh, I made 300 buttons. I dispensed about a hundred of them. So yeah, there's still a bunch of buttons that I didn't get out there, but I choose to look at it as I got a hundred buttons in the hands of other people, you know, that kind of thing. So and speaking of yeah. those buttons, if you would like a button, send us an email. Oh, sure. I will take the time to mail them to you. If you want some buttons, like, I mean, we have like business cards yeah. and stuff, you know, l- l- you know, cool little stuff, but I'll, I'll mail you a button an envelope with a button. I'll, I'll take the time to do that. Send us an email, request a button, uh, send us a message on Facebook, request a button, get us your information. Yeah. I'll, I'll do that. I got a bunch of stamps at the house. I'll, I'll utilize what I have, um, get that stuff out to you so you can have an O'Reilly button too. Um, you know, share the show that way. Yeah. Anything, anything that we could do to help you help us, we're all in favor of it. And, uh, and with that... Let's wrap it up. So, if you've enjoyed what we've done here, and you would like to help us out, as we were saying, you can donate to the show through patreon.com slash Radio and get early access to the full show content and offshoots and the pre-show and post-show content and things that we just don't show in the normal feed. Uh, make that algorithm work for us, because really it is. We're working against math and some really arbitrary stuff that they're putting out there. So, boosting it with an iTunes rating, a favorable situation, rating or, or a speaker rating anything wherever you found us that actually allows for ratings boost those numbers for us please and use your words you know tell somebody about us you leave a nice review with flowery words some somebody will read it and then they'll say hey what's this about and they'll actually take a look at us and that would be helpful and of course engage with us directly send us those messages on the social medias and the electronic mails at O'Reilly Radio Podcast at gmail.com if you're the more talkative sort, 470-222-6759. That's always ready to take your call or text. And by that, if you don't want your voice out there, if you want to remain anonymous, I don't have to mention your name. So s- still, send us a message. That would help. And if you don't like what we've done here this evening, you can contact the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-8255. That service is available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. The Lifeline provides free and confidential support for people in distress, prevention and crisis resources for you or your loved ones, and best practices for professionals. Thank you for choosing to waste your valuable time with us. This has been O'Reilly Radio, part of the Random Acts Company. This work is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution 3.0, United States license, including the music Rocket and Pemgea, created by Kevin McLeod of Incomptech.com. By the way, that license is where it's a share-alike attribution license. So you can go ahead and chop up the show as long as you attribute it back to us in some way and share it with somebody else. We're cool with that. Just let them know how to get the original. And we're cool. All right. That said, we'll see you next time. Really Radio, signing off.